Hello again and thanks for watching. In this video I'll be speaking on proof of the Bible's legitimacy and its prophetic accuracy. I'll be using the book of Daniel and the reason I've chosen this book is because we have manuscripts copied by the Qumran community dated as far back as 150 BC in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were six copies found covering all but one chapter in the book of Daniel. This proves that the book of Daniel was considered to be inspired scripture, which also proves that the book of Daniel was around decades before 150 BC. Before we get into the content, I should warn you that this is going to be very historically rich, so you may want to pause parts of this section to check your facts. Because of the amount of content, I'll be putting links in the description to different references so you can skip to wherever you want. We're going to look in chapter 11 because it lays out some very detailed prophecies in chronological order. Some of these prophecies go way back, but we'll look at all of them uh, because each prophecy builds on the next, just as history has built on itself. I'm going to be covering 500 years of prophetic fulfillment, which means that this will be a very lengthy crash course history lesson. If you want to skip down to 150 BC without getting lost, uh, with, you can click here. Otherwise, let's go ahead and get started with verse 2. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realms of Grecia. This is the angel Gabriel speaking to Daniel during the reign of Cyrus. We're talking around 530 BC. We know historically that he was followed by Cambyses II, who reigned for eight years. After him was Gamata the Magian, aka the Pseudo Smyrtus, who only reigned during 522 BC. The third king after Cyrus was King Darius the Great. His reign spanned from 522 to 486 BC, and the fourth king was Xerxes. His father and predecessor left him with the task of punishing the Greeks for helping out with the Ionian Rebellion and their, uh, and their defeat at the Battle of Marathon. For three years, Xerxes prepared to get revenge against the Greeks. During this time, he formed an alliance with Carthage and even had help from many smaller Greek states. Finally, in the spring of 480 BC, he left from Sardis with a large fleet and an army estimated at 2 million by some historians. For about three months, he had success against the Greeks until the Battle of Salamis. This would inevitably lead to his defeat in the war and the conception of the Greek Empire through the formation of the Dalian League, also known as the Athenian Empire, in 477 BC. Now verse 3. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. We'll see in the next couple of verses that this is an obvious reference to Alexander the Great. I won't go into too much detail because most people know who he was. At, the height of, at, at his height, his empire spanned from southern Europe to northern Africa to central Asia. His reign lasted from 336 to 323 BC. Verse 4, And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided towards the four winds of the heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. After Alexander died, there was a huge feud over the control of the kingdom. When all was said and done, all but two of his generals were dead, along with seven of his family members. Just as the Bible prophesied, the kingdom was divided into four parts. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion, and his dominion shall be, uh, shall be a great dominion. In 281 BC, the kingdom was down to two divisions. Ptolemy I, Soter, who ruled over Egypt and the Holy Land, and his protege, Seleucus I, Nicator, who ruled in Babylon and Persia. Seleucus I became very powerful after killing Lysimachus, who ruled in Asia Minor in battle. On to verse 6. And in the end of years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. What happened here is a classic soap opera. Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, who was the king of the south, sent his daughter, Berenice, to Antiochus II, Theos. Uh, he was the king of the north, and he was to be married in, uh, in order to end the war between them known as the Second Syrian War. 
This plan probably would have worked out great if it wasn't for one minor issue. Antiochus II was already married to Laodicea. He went ahead with it anyways for the sake of peace and regaining possessions his father lost to the king of the south. His new wife, Berenice, uh, persuaded him to reject Laodicea's children so that her children could reign on the throne. This house of cards lasted for about three years until Ptolemy II died. Antiochus II went back to Laodicea, who many historians believe murdered him by poisoning. She then convinced her to, to kill Berenice with, and her son. When all was said and done, every bit of the prophecy in Daniel 11.6 was fulfilled. Verse 7, But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with, it, with an army, and shall enter into the forces, fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail. This is where Ptolemy III, Eurgetes, uh, enters the picture. When he finds out that his sister and nephew were murdered, he immediately invaded the Seleucid Empire. He would capture La uh, Laodicea and put her to death. On to verse 8. And shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods, with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold. And he shall continue more years in the king of the north. Most historians agree that during the Third Syrian War, Ptolemy III from the south recovered many of the sacred statues that the Persian had taken three centuries earlier. This is where he got the name Eurgites, which means benefactor. It's also recorded that he acquired a lot of silver and gold, and he, outli and he outlived uh, Seleucus II for about four or five years. Now verse 9. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. Seleucus II did try to invade Egypt to give back a Ptolemy III, but his fleet was lost in a storm which forced him to, tur to turn back. Verse 10. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. The sons prophesied of here are Seleucus III, uh, Seronos, a.k.a. Thunder, and Antiochus III, the Great. Seleucus III, who was the older brother, started a war in Asia Minor against the Egyptian provinces. He didn't have much success and actually ended up getting assassinated by soldiers of his own army. When Antiochus III took the throne, he had much more success. He was able to get through most of Judea and almost made it to the borders of Egypt. Verse 11, And the king of the south shall be moved with choler, and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. The fulfillment of this prophecy occurred in 217 at the Battle of Raphia, or the Battle of Gaza, whichever title you prefer. This is just 67 years before the earliest date of the writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. As I said at the beginning of this video, we know for a fact that these had to have been copies of copies from the original. We know that because they believe the book of Daniel to be inspired, or at least significant enough for them to have made the vast assortment of manuscripts found of the book of Daniel. It is next to impossible for the book of Daniel to have been written after this time and gained enough traction for the Qumran community to have put out what was discovered in the, De in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This means that from this point on, we have proof that the prophecies written predate their fulfillment. Anyone who would deny this is in denial of logic and science. So let's get back to the fulfillment. In this battle, Antiochus III, who was over the north, had 62,000 infantry, 6,000 cavalry, and 103 war elephants. Yet somehow, Ptolemy IV's military was able to overcome the forces of the north, causing them to retreat to Lebanon. Verse 12, And when he had taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. After the battle of Gaza, Ptolemy IV spent just three months getting everything in order before going back to Alexandria. In his haste to get back, he left the port of Seleucia in Perea open for the taking of Antiochus III. Also after the battle, many of the Egyptian troops that were trained to fight the Seleucids started a rebellion against his rule in Egypt. By the time Ptolemy IV died, they had total independence in southern Egypt. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with, and with much riches. After Ptolemy IV died, Antiochus III launched an attack against the south to regain the territory he had lost 18 years earlier. 
He was successful until he withdrew for the winter, and Scopas of Aetolia reconquered the southern part of the territory, including Judea and Jerusalem, which sets the stage for a few verses later. Verse 14, And in those times shall, uh, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Just as prophesied, Antiochus III made an alliance with King Philip V of Macedonia, and there were many more enemies who rose up against the south. Antiochus was able to deliver a crushing defeat to the, uh, to the um, Ptolemaic forces at Peneus, which is located at the fountains of Jordan. This occurred around 200 BC, just 50 years before the discovered writings of the book of Daniel and the Dead Sea Scrolls. As for Israel's part in this prophecy, I'll just quote from Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews. Yet was it not long afterward when Antiochus overcame Scopus in a battle fought at the uh, fountains of Jordan and destroyed a great part of his army. But afterwards, when Antiochus subdued those cities of Ces uh, Cilicia, which Scopus had gotten into his possession, and Samaria with them, the Jews of their own accord went over to him and received him into the city which is Jerusalem, and gave plentiful provision to all his army and to his elephants, and readily assisted him when he besieged the garrison which was in the citadel of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, this did the Israelites no good, as, later, as they later fell when Antiochus IV came to Jerusalem. On to verse 15. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount, and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall be any strength to, uh, to withstand. After losing the Battle of Peneus, Scopus and his men retreated to the fortified port city of, of Sidon. Antiochus III in turn laid siege on the city, until Scopus surrendered on the conditions of his return to Egypt. Verse 16, But he that cometh against him shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. Now that Scopus was out of the picture, Antiochus had the Holy Land for good. It was now the domain of the north. He shall also set his face to enter with the, with the strength of his whole kingdom, and, the, uh, and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. Now that Antiochus III had control of Canaan land, he set his eyes on Egypt. His plan was to send his daughter, Ptolemy V, as part of a treaty in order to get a foothold into Egypt. However, his daughter, Cleopatra I, stayed true to her husband instead of her dad. Verse 18, After this he shall turn his face unto the isles, and shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach he shall cause it to turn upon him. Since uh, Antiochus wasn't able to get Egypt, he set his sights on the Isles of Greece by aiding the Aetolians. He also tried sending ambassadors to Rome to form a partnership, but the Aetolians had grown hostile towards Roman rule. So the Senate in Rome was only willing to partner with Antiochus III on the conditions that he, led the, that he let the Greeks in Asia stay free and if he stayed away from Europe. This only motivated Antiochus to go to war against the Romans. He was able to overtake some strongholds in Asia Minor. The only problem for Antiochus III was that in doing this, he alienated King Philip V. The Romans went on attack on the attack in Asia, Asia Minor and dealt a damaging blow to Antiochus at the Battle of Magnesia in 190 BC. This led to his inevitable defeat and a peace treaty that required him to hand over 20 hostages, including his son, reduce his naval ship to 12, and compensate Rome for the cost of the, of the war over the next 12 years by paying 15,000 talents, and that's the equivalent of $200 million. Verse 19, Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall, and not be found. Antiochus' kingdom dwindled after his return, and he struggled to find the money to pay Rome. While trying to plunder a pagan temple in Babylon, he was killed. This occurred about 35 years before the time of the manuscript's writing. Verse 20, Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within a few days shall he be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Antiochus, is, uh, third, Antiochus III's old eldest son 
Seleucus IV Philopater, took over his throne. Because of the extreme tax he had to pay Rome, and having a smaller kingdom, he was forced to be aggressive in raising taxes. While this was going on, the Roman Senate decided to trade Antiochus IV, who they held co uh, hostage, for Demetrius, who was Seleucus IV's oldest son, or just one of his sons, and next in line to be king. When Antiochus IV was freed, he went to Athens. And in 175 BC, this prophecy was fulfilled. Seleucus IV was killed, not in anger, nor in battle, but by being poisoned by his minister, Heliodorus. Historians don't agree on the motive behind the murder, but what we do know is that the outcome was Seleucus' son, who was, named, who was also named Antiochus, becoming the king at only five years old, while Heliodorus pulled the strings from behind the scenes. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Once Antiochus IV found out what had happened to his brother, he quickly sailed from Athens to Pergamum. Through flattery, he was able to get help from Eumenes II, who was the king there. With his assistance, Antiochus IV overthrew Heliodorus and became a co-ruler and protector of the infant king. The young king was murdered a few, a few years later while Antiochus IV was conveniently absent, which allowed him to usurp the throne. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. The prince of the covenant here is a reference to the Jewish high priest Onias III. His brother, named Jason, bribed Antiochus IV to, remain, to remove Onias and make him high priest. Two years, two years later, in 172 BC, Jason sent a high priest made, named uh, uh, Menelaus to Antiochus IV with money. Menelaus, in turn, took that money, added some of his own, and bribed Antiochus IV over the high priest position. Antiochus had no problem double-crossing Jason for some bribe money. Verse 23, And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Just, after his, just as his father before him, Antiochus IV set his sights for the south. He sought an alliance with his nephew, uh, Ptolemy VI, in hopes to exploit weaknesses in, the, in his kingdom to take over Egypt. He also set through Syria and Judea into Egypt with a small army, claiming he was coming to protect his nephew. He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, and spoil, and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. Just as prophesied, Antiochus, under the guise of loyalty to, to Ptolemy VI, took down most of the Egyptian strongholds, uh, mostly through scheming and manipulation. He targeted the richest ones first, so he could win over the citizens' loyalty by sharing the spoils from the battle. Verse 25. And he shall stir up his power and, and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. In 170 BC, Antiochus felt that his kingdom was ready to try to expand into Egypt. He gathered an army to begin what, what would be known as the Sixth Syrian War. He met resistance at the border of, e border of Egypt in Pelusium by the Nile Delta. They had arrayed a bigger army against him, but they were weaker in battle and disloyal to their king. They quickly surrendered to Antiochus to form an alliance with him. He then went on to conquer Memphis the same way. Yea, they that feed the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. Traitors were rampant in Ptolemy the sixth army. The Egyptian king was thought of by many to be weak and Antiochus was very cunning in his ability to attract and corrupt high-ranking officers to his side. This caused much disarray and led to many being killed. And both these kings' hearts shall be one to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the, the time appointed. After Antiochus had Pelusium and Memphis, he turned his attention toward Alexandria. The Alexandrians had dethroned Ptolemy VI, and put in his brother Ptolemy the Seventh in his place. At Memphis, Antiochus and Ptolemy the Sixth met together a lot. Antiochus the Fourth expressed great friendship toward his nephew, but in reality, his plan was to divide and conquer Egypt 
by setting the two brothers against each other. Ptolemy VI expressed, expressed mutual feelings of friendship toward Antiochus and blamed the war on one of his ministers. He was also scheming against his uncle to regain alliance with his brother to join forces against him. Verse 28. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. While Antiochus was in Egypt, a false rumor spread around Judea that he had been killed. When Jason learned of this, he raised an army of 1,000 men to attack Jerusalem and reassert him as the high priest. When Antiochus found out what had happened, he looked at it as a revolt against him. On his way back from Egypt, he attacked Jerusalem with a vengeance. He commanded that every man, woman, and child that his soldier found to be killed. After all was said and done, 40 to 80,000 men were slaughtered, and around the same number of people were taken and sold into slavery. He then ransacked the temple and took many of the holy vessels there. At the time appointed he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. While this was going on, the two brothers named Ptolemy were able to reconcile their differences and share the kingdom. This voided, voided the alliance Antiochus IV had had with Ptolemy VI. Of course, this prompted Antiochus to go to war against Egypt. He would not have the same success this time. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return, and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Knowing that Antiochus' army was too powerful for them to over overcome, Ptolemy's brothers, uh, the Ptolemy brothers asked Rome to step in and help them out. The Romans agreed in order to ensure that, that the Greeks wouldn't become a threat to them through expansion. So they set sail from Chittim, which is on the west coast of Cyprus. They met up with uh, Antiochus IV before he reached Alexandria, where they demanded his withdrawal from Egypt. When Antiochus asked time to consider, the Roman ambassador drew a circle around Antiochus and told him not to leave until he gave an answer. After a few moments, he agreed to their demands. On his way back from being humiliated by the Romans, he decided to take out his anger on the Jews. All the Jews who resisted were killed, but he did allow any Jew who identified to be for Antiochus to live. Verse 31, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifices, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Antiochus and his army did horrible things with the temple. They stopped the daily sacrifices and built a pagan altar over the altar of burnt offering in the temple and placed an image of Zeus Olympias over it. Then they made a burnt offering of pigs to Zeus on the altar. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their gods shall be strong and do exploits. After putting the image of Zeus over the altar, he commanded that the Jews abandon their customs customs and be one people with the rest of the kingdom. Many people abandoned practicing the law completely, but just as the verse stated, the people that knew their God stood strong and rejected the wickedness that was shoved in their faces. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by the flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. The Torah became outlawed by Antiochus. Anyone who was found with a copy was to be killed, and the book would be burned. Anyone who was circumcised was also be, to be killed, along with his or her entire family and the person who gave the circumcision. Even in the face of this persecution, many stood uncompromised to the point of death. Verse 34, Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Because of the bravery of the faithful Jews, a rebellion was birthed. With Judas Maccabee at the helm, they were able to defeat a large army of Antiochus IV led by his general Apollonius. This only attracted more men to their cause. After Apollonius, Siron commanding the Syrian army attacked, but was also unsuccessful in defeating the Jews. When Antiochus heard what had happened, he gave everyone who would join him to attack Judea a year's wages. This made it necessary for him to go to Persia to raise the money. So he left Lysias in charge and sent 47,000 men against Judas' 3,000. When the dust settled, the Syrians had run away, leaving 3,000 men dead on the battlefield. Then, then they came back again, this time with 65,000, while Judas' army had grown to 10,000. Just as before, the Jews were victorious in killing 5,000 men. This time they were able to recapture the temple. In 164 BC, 
Antiochus IV's army was uh, defeated in Persia when he tried to loot it for gold and silver. This was just before he heard the news about what happened in Judea. He took it so badly that he became bedridden and ended up dying. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. The Gentile nations did not take very well to the victory over the Seleucids. They began killing and, perse and persecuting the Jews every chance they got. The Jews were able to keep their sovereignty until the time appointed. That phrase is a reference to the 70-week prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. The appointed time was when the Messiah would come. Verse 36, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify above every, himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. The next king to reign over Israel was Herod. I know many Christians who think that the verse speaks about uh, the coming Antichrist, but if we follow the chronology, it makes more sense that Herod would be the next person here. In reality, many of the leaders in this passage, including Herod, are pictures of the Antichrist. Herod was known as a ruthless leader, just as the others prophesied before. He did whatever his will dictated and made himself higher than every god, even to the point of appointing himself the high priest. Let's look at verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Herod's family had converted to Judaism in 200 BC, yet he promoted Greek and Roman gods. He was responsible for building the temple in Caesarea for the worship of Caesar Augustus, along with many other temples to various gods. When Herod remodeled the Jewish temple, he put a golden uh, Roman eagle at the main entrance. And after a group of Torah students destroyed it, Herod had them burned alive. Herod was also famous for murdering the desire of women for many by killing an untold number of infant children in order to eradicate the threat of a Messiah. Let's look at uh, verse 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not, uh, knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Herod's god was whoever provided military force, and in his time it was the Roman emperors. He built many temples and fortresses and named them after Caesar to honor him, as well as sending representatives to Rome to give gifts and money to honor Caesar. Let's look at verse 39. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange god, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. With the backing of Rome, Herod was able to solidify his position as king over Judea. He also gave away the, uh, land to people with influence to get their loyal, loyalty. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the country, then shall overflow and pass over. In verses 40 to 43, Daniel puts it uh, in a parenthesis to reveal the last major battle before the Messiah would come. Mark Antony, Octavius, and Marcus Aemilius Lepidus had formed a pact to rule over Rome after Julius Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC. Things were pretty good until Antony fell in love with Cleopatra, who was queen over Egypt. Antony divorced Octavia, who was Octavius' sister, and gave a lot of territory over to Cleopatra. All of this would end up in a civil war of the Roman Senate and Octavius against Antony and Cleopatra. Plutarch, who was a Roman historian, recorded that Antony made the first act of aggression, which prompted the war. As far as Herod was concerned, he supported Antony. He wanted to join forces with him to fight Octavius, but Antony asked him and his troop to, find the, to fight the, Neba the Nebatians instead. Plutarch records that Antony had acquired a massive infantry, but opted to attack mostly with ships at the advice of Cleopatra. Antony's fleet ended up getting flanked near Actium, which prompted Cleopatra to return back to Egypt with her 40 ships. Antony, in turn, broke through the enemy lines to catch up with her on, the way on her way back, leaving the rest of the ships with no hope. When Herod heard the news of Antony's defeat, he switched sides by helping prevent some of Antony's troops reach Egypt to help him. Herod then risked his life to meet with Octavius and humbly pledge his loyalty. Octavius accepted and allowed him to keep his rule over Judea. Octavius then traveled down to Alexandria by land and overwhelmed Antony's dwindling forces. They surrendered without even a fight. 
In the end, the war was decided with chariots, horsemen, and many ships, just as the prophecy said. Let's look at verse 41. And he shall enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon. On his way down to Egypt, Octavius passed through Syria, Judea, which is referred to as the glorious land, as well as many other countries. Just as prophesied, Edom, Moab, and Ammon were not invaded. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. After Antony's military surrendered, uh, Antony fell on his sword after hearing that Cleopatra was dead, even though she was still alive. He did not die immediately, which gave him time to go see her and die in her arms. Cleopatra would try to negotiate with Octavian and ask to be imprisoned if her son could be spared. But after Octavian told her what he wanted her to do, she committed suicide. Octavian then killed her son to eliminate any threat he could pose. Verse 43. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians, and the Ethiopians shall uh, be at his steps. Now that Cleopatra and her son were out of the picture, Octavian had control over Egypt, including its vast treasures and wealth. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with a great fury to destroy, and utterly to make away many. Now we're back to Herod, uh, and we know this because the next verse gives the location of the palace. Uh, uh, You've got to keep in mind that we're dealing with Hebrew grammar here, so the antecedent can be before or after the pronoun. The tidings from the east would come from the Magi who told him that the Messiah was born. If you're familiar with the Christmas story, you know that this prompted him to order all the, Ill, all the male infants and babies in Bethlehem to be killed. The news from the north would come from his oldest son, Antipater. He conspired to take over his throne by sending letters to him from Rome, saying that his younger brothers were unfairly criticizing him to Caesar. This made Herod very angry, and he ended up killing all three of the sons involved. Just to give you an idea of how crazy Herod was, when he was nearing the end of his life, he ordered that all the chief men of Judea meet him at Jer- Jericho. He had them all in a stadium for horse racing, and then ordered his sister and brother-in-law to kill them all. His thinking was that if he killed the Jews' leaders, it would, uh, it would lead to mourning that would also cause the people to mourn his death. Thankfully, they did not carry this out. Uh, let's look at the last verse here. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and, and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. And just as the uh, prophecy says, Herod had many palaces built in Judea, including two in Jerusalem. Herod would fall ill to what many historians think was syphilis, and he did everything he could to find someone who could help him recover. But there was no one. Uh, he, couldn't, uh, he would even attempt to, suicide, uh, to commit suicide with a paring knife, but his cousin stopped him, and he would die just five days after that. So that concludes this chapter, and as you can see, every one of these detailed prophecies were fulfilled 100%. I just picked one chapter, chapter out of the book of Daniel, but there are literally hundreds of prophecies that have been fulfilled, just like the ones here. To say that this is just a coincidence or that the prophecies were self-fulfilled simply defies logic. If this is not enough to convince you of the Bible's legitimacy, I don't know what will, but I'm still not done. In the next video, we'll be talking about the Bible's divine preservation and its influence as proof that it is the Word of God. Thanks for watching.